Okay, hello everybody, and welcome to our DEF CON talk, A Pain in the NAS, Exploiting Cloud Connectivity to Porn Your NAS Devices. So, my name is Noah Moshe, I'm a vulnerability researcher in Clarity Team 82, uh, and with me today is Sharon Brzezinov, our director of research, and as you can see behind us, this is our playground, this is where we have fun. We mainly look at IoT and OT products, uh, be it PLCs, HMIs, and of course, like I'm gonna show you case to you today, NAS devices. And our job is basically breaking them and looking for cool vulnerabilities, which let's say it's heaven in life. Uh, of course, we'd like to make huge thanks to the other Team82 researchers that helped us in this research, Uri Katz and Vera Mans. Huge thanks to you and your guys rock. So let's talk about what we're gonna showcase to you today. You see, I have an asset at home where I store all of my spicy content, like for example, my documents, the, of course, uh, government stuff, and some kind of pictures, let's say. Uh, and that way, that's why when Pwn to Own competition in Toronto last year decided to do the NAS category, well, the goal was to hack and exploit uh, remote code execution vulnerabilities on these NAS devices, that, which one of which I actually own, I said, yeah, let's do it and let's go all in and let's pwn both of these devices. You see, we try to look at kind of esoteric features because both of these NAS devices were quite old and looked at by different researcher groups uh, over the years. So we try to look at what kind of interesting stuff can we look at that maybe other researchers less likely put the effort and time into. And that's when we realized that actually both of these NAS platforms have a cloud platforms, allowing users to actually access and use their NAS remotely through the cloud. In the case of Western Digital, it is MyCloud OS 5, and in the case of Synology, it is Quick Connect uh, cloud services. Now, I asked myself, what's the use case here? Why should I uh, enable my cloud, uh, my device to connect to the cloud? And actually, that's the reason, you see. My NAS sits at home, where I save all my same important stuff to it, and I am out and about. I could be at work, I could be on a vacation, etc. However, I want to access my files now. So that way, through the cloud application, I am trying and requesting my files and fetching them remotely. But when I saw that this is the use case and business logic, I thought to myself, hey, maybe we can use it somehow and have attackers access the files we save on our NAS through the cloud, not requiring direct access. Somehow they can request and fetch the files and get hold to my sensitive data. And that is exactly the kind of ability we gained in the months leading to Pwn to Own competition, where we were able to access, read, and write every file that was stored on a NAS device worldwide. And you can imagine the catastrophic uh, implications of it. I shouldn't say seeing sensitive files, of course, and maybe altering them somehow. However, we thought to ourselves, yeah, that's cool. However, what could be cooler? I mean, fetching files is cool. However, the holy grail is actually executing code on the NAS devices through the cloud, meaning somehow I am able to access people's home network through the cloud application. And as it turns out, this is exactly the kind of vulnerability chain we exploited in the Pwn to Own competition, netting us 40K uh, dollars and of course chaining five different vulnerabilities to attack cloud, the NAS devices. However, since our attack leveraged the cloud, we were able to not attack just one device, but instead we could attack any cloud connected device, giving us access to billion, millions and millions of different devices worldwide. And actually, the vulnerabilities we uncovered were so severe that Western Digital had to boot off devices running all firmwares from their cloud access, meaning if you are not patched and, is, and no longer vulnerable to the vulnerabilities we discovered, you can no longer access your device through the cloud. This is because we identified some architecture flaws that had to be changed, meaning all devices can no longer connect to the cloud services. Well, that is the gist of our research, so I hope you intrigued you, but let's deep dive and see how we uncovered all of the, these vulnerabilities and what kind of vulnerabilities we actually managed to achieve. So let's start with Western Digital. In the Pwn to Own competition, we looked at Western Digital PR4100. This is the, the cutie right there, uh, and it is actually a custom Linux-based machine uh, running x86 64-bit processor. 
Uh, and inside this machine, many services are running. Of course, we have the usual suspect, the web management port, where most of the prior vulnerabilities were discovered. However, since it is a NAS device, a lot of file fetching and file accessing services also exist, like FSMB, FTP, and of course, accessing the files over the uh, HTTP requests. Well, the first thing I did was order the device. However, I am a very impatient man, meaning I could not wait for the postal service to get my device to me. That's why I went to Western Digital's website and looked for a firmware download in the, in, in, when trying to emulate my device and getting access to it even before it arrives. Usually when we work with firmwares, there are two options. Either the firmware is encrypted, meaning everything is encrypted somehow and the device decrypts it during runtime and during the upgrading process, or it is simply unencrypted and containing all of the different sections within the firmware. Luckily for us, Western Digital chose to not encrypt their firmware, meaning we add access to all of the different files, file system, binaries, configurations, etc., that are running inside our NAS device. Sadly, this firmware was not a full-on uh, file system, meaning we had to pick and choose and reconstruct the file system from the different sections. That is because all of the different sections contain different files for the file system. However, they were not organized and not in the corresponding uh, places. Luckily for us, we looked at the few files inside the firmware and we found an init script that actually reconstructed the firmware for, for us. This script is being ran whenever a firmware upgrade procedure happens. And then using a virtual machine and a true device, we were able to reconstruct and rebuild the firmware and run the web services. We now had access to the NAS device even without ordering it. And this actually gave us two main benefits. First of all, I was more well versed. I knew what kind of services were running, what were all the configuration files, what binaries are actually being executed. And even more important, I had a playground that I could brick. I tend to brick devices that I look at, and my boss has to reorder ones, and he gets mad at me, especially when they are super expensive. So now I have a playground, I can just do whatever I want if I delete the whole file system by accident, which I did in a few researches in the past. No problem, I'll just boot up to the latest snapshot. Well, let's take a look at the first part we looked at, the web management architecture. This is the gist of it, and let me explain to you. As I told you before, this was the main focus of researchers in the past, where multiple vulnerabilities in the PHP and CGI scripts were found and identified, and actually exploited in the pwn to own competition. In order to remedy that, Western Digital had a genius idea of just wrapping it all up in a Golang binary that actually authenticates and authorizes all, any requests performed to the backends. This meant that even though we did, and yeah, we did find a few vulnerabilities and remote code execution vulnerabilities in the web server, since every request had to be authenticated, it was not that useful in the pwn to own competition because every request, every exploit should be unauthenticated. This meant that we had to scrap this entire lead and look for new leads somewhere else, and that's when we turned our heads into the cloud features of the system. You see, the cloud features, especially in Western Digital uh, case, are very, very opted in and, and prompted to users to enable them. It is actually in the name of the device, my cloud, and a lot, most of the users actually enable this feature and are able to access their files through the cloud services. All you need to do is enable this tick and box right here, which you are encouraged to do by Western Digital User, user Interface. And then using uh, an account, a cloud account, you are able to associate your account with your NAS device, and now are able to access it through either the mobile application or the web application of your choice. However, when we realized that, we thought to ourselves, how the hell does this magic happen? How am I navigated and routed to my NAS device? Well, like I've told you before, whenever I'm using the Western Digital application, I am authenticated to my account. And before I create my account, I associate it with my NAS device. Now, each NAS device is identified by a unique GUID uh, installation, and that way, whenever I try to, let's say, access files, I specify my GUID to Western Digital's well, cloud services, and then behind the scenes, uh, scenes, somehow, they route my request to my corresponding NAS device, and this tunnel is created. 
However, we thought to ourselves, what would happen if some attacker knew my device is GUID and would try to use the API routes and URLs to access my NAS device? Well, we tried that and it didn't work. So it's not that easy. However, since we tried it on our device, we opened TCP dump in the background and we noticed something weird. You see, the request was made to our device, meaning we reached it, and instead of being blocked by the cloud application, we were blocked by the NAS, meaning we actually reached one of its internal ports. Now, this is quite crazy, because my NAS sits at home. It is not internet exposed, doesn't, uh, I didn't open any ports in the firewall, and it doesn't have an external IP address, meaning somehow, through Western Digital servers, I was able to access my home network, my LAN home network, and access one of the internal services that are running there in my NAS device. When we realized that, our game plan was quite simple. I mean, all we need to do is just know a device's GUID, which is 128 random bit uh, GUID, find somehow some authentication by bypasses, and exploit some vulnerabilities to run code on our device. Yeah, pretty easy. So let's try and understand what is the use case once again? You see, this is the regular use case in the NAS architecture, a user trying to access their NAS from anywhere around the world. However, Western Digital also thought about another use case. What happens when the user sits at home? Like, so for example, sitting on couch and wanting to access their spicy movies. Well, if they were able to access, if they needed to actually fetch the files over the cloud, it means that there will be a lot of latency and bad user experience. And that's not actually very smart. So instead, Western Digital implemented this procedure right here. Whenever a user sits at home, they are redirected to their NAS device and then fetch files locally over the LAN access. However, somehow Western Digital had to make sure that the users were accessing a real de the real device and not, let's say, an attacker. How did they do that? Well, in order to do that, Western Digital actually issued a unique certificate to each device, and that way, whenever I try to access it, I am able to make sure and check that I am indeed accessing my real device. However, the keen-eyed in you probably noticed something weird. What is that? As you can see, embedded in the certificate, here it lies, my device's GUID. This means that by simply fetching and accessing my device through the HTTPS services, I am able to get the device a certificate and carve out the GUID through, through it. Th while this was pretty cool, sadly, our attack scenario involves not being able to access the, the device, meaning we want to access it through the cloud, so it's not pretty practical, but maybe somehow we can improve it. Well, that's when we turn our heads and realized and try to realize how the hell does this redirect work? I mean, how does this magic happen? Well, you see, Western Digital actually added a DNS name for each NAS device, and that way, whenever I'm in local network, it tries to access this DSS name, and this DSS name actually maps to an internal IP address of my device. That, as you can see, I can use NS lookup on my device's name, and that way, when the, in the result, I see the internal IP address of my device, and that way I'm able to access it locally through the LAN interface. However, this meant that a DNS record was created, and because it was created, of course, we can exploit it, and that's why using passive DNS servers, we were able to retrieve old DNS queries. You see, some DNS servers actually sell the metadata of user requests uh, that are performed to their DNS servers to the highest bidder, and sadly, in the internet, there are a lot of APIs and servers that allow users to search for all DNS queries user performed uh, in order to basically get access to what kind of DNS queries user used. And because we, the GUID is in this DNS record, we are able to retrieve it. And as you can see, it's not a one-off. We actually see tens of thousands of different DNS records, meaning we now had access to tens of thousands uh, uh, GUIDs. 
Sadly, when we tried accessing, uh, actually accessing these GUIs through Western Digital's cloud, most of them were already dead and disconnected. That's because we don't know when the re DNS record was created and they were no longer connected anyways. Uh, this meant we no didn't actually have 10,000 records. However, we had a good lead into actually improving the amount of the uh, GUIs we know of. That's when we realized that because the certificate is issued to every device, every connected device, and this certificate contains the device GUID, maybe we can use what's called certificate harvesting. Similar to the passive DNS servers, there are a lot of servers uh, offering the ability of you to users to look for say, certificates they encounter and look for patterns uh, in the certificate name. For example, we use Census, which boasts they have over 6 billion certificates in their databases, allowing users to query and fetch these certificates. When we tried and grabbed for Western Digital pattern, we realized something shocking. There was over 1.5 million devices just in the last three months. And now we had the knowledge of every one of these devices GUID, meaning we were able to access them through Western Digital uh, cloud platforms. However, sadly, in the Pwn to Own competition, you have to do it live, meaning we cannot uh, know the GUID in advance, and our device is connected in real time. This meant we had to somehow get access to GUID and get knowledge of GUIDs in real time. That's when we discovered something pretty cool which I wasn't aware of in the past, which, co which is called CTL, Certificate Transparency Log. You see, there was kind of a specification called CTL in the internet uh, with the goal of improving security and visibility in the internet. What CTL means is that whenever a certificate authority, a CA, issues a new certificate, it sends the metadata about this certificate to a live public feed, allowing users to simply subscribe to this feed and get knowledge of the certificate being issued, issued mainly the certificate CN, and of course the validity date, etc. Luckily for us, the there are many tools that enable us to subscribe to the CTL feed and using them we were able to subscribe to the CTL feed and grab for Western Digital pattern and that way we were able to get a device's GUIDs whenever they actually connected to the uh, network in the first time. Meaning we had the ability to leak GUID and leak the knowledge of the device's GUID in real time whenever it connected. And we simply did it for a few days and we actually got amazing results, getting us tens of thousands of different devices GUIDs which we were able to access through the loophole and through the exposed APIs in Western Digital's cloud services. Cool, that meant that instead of breaking a device's GUID, we simply leaked all of them and we now had the knowledge of every device GUID worldwide. The next thing we had to do is find some kind of an out bypass. Well, since we are a community in our Oak, we simply asked someone, hey, can we, uh, can we use your device? We promised not to break it and, and luckily we didn't, uh, so we didn't have to buy him a new one. Uh, so we tried basically accessing the device's GUID using our own authenticated account. So all we did was simply open up our web browser, connecting to our account, and simply stop the request and change the device's GUID from our own to the GUID we wanted to test our theories on. And that's when we realized that some API routes actually worked. As you can see here, we are fetching a file ID of a device we do not own and are not associated with. All we did was simply change the GUID and some API routes just work. That's pretty crazy and pretty lucky. As it turns out, Western Digital only checked for authentication instead of authorization. Meaning as long as I have a valid user session and is connected to my account, I can access anyone NAS through some API routes by simply changing the device's GUID. That meant we now had access to everyone's sensitive files. We could, for example, view them, change them, leak them, do whatever we want, and that's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty lucky, however, sadly, Around two, two weeks before the competitions, I tried my scripts, which worked perfectly, I swear, uh, and they stopped working. Something changed in Western Digital backends and the authorization checked was added, which was pretty sad because it took uh, 
many months of uh, work down the drain and we just had to find some new vulnerabilities. That's when I said, oh fuck, I'll have to do some overnights <laughs> and yeah, let's go again. Well, since I exhausted the API routes lead, I thought to myself, yeah, I need to go back to the source and look for the main binary handling cloud connection. In Western Digital case, it was a binary called REST SDK. This binary actually binded on the device and connected to Western Digital proxy servers and handled most of, most of the cloud functionality, like fetching files, changing files, etc. Sadly, this binary is written in Golang, which I personally hate because it's huge. It has tons of different functions and tons of different layers of abstraction, making reverse engineering pretty sad and boring. Uh, and of course, since it's written in, in Golang, there is less attack surface because the memory is managed by Golang itself. A lot of APIs are secure by default uh, and there's less uh, error place for developers to make mistakes. So in order to avoid reverse engineering as much as possible, all I had to do was simply create a man in the middle setup between me and the device, between the device and the cloud, meaning whenever the cloud uh, tries to interact with my device or vice versa, I will be able to view the traffic uh, and see what's happening behind the scenes. We did it through many methods, mainly uh, adding a certificate authority uh, CA that we control on the device locally and that way we could basically man in the middle HTTPS requests, just making the device trust our CA and issuing device certificates on the fly. However, that way we were able to view and see the requests in real time and see what's happening at any time whatsoever. And when we, through, when we had this ability, our first goal was simply understanding how the hell does the tunnel pre proxy creation happens. How my device connects to the cloud and informs it, hey, I'm this and that device, please redirect users to me. And through the process of man in the middle and reverse engineering, we reached this conclusion. The first thing happen that happens is my device connecting to Western Digital Proxy servers over TLS connection. The minute the device connects, the cloud says, hey, cool, I want to create a proxy connection and fetches in HTTP2 an API route on my device. The AP, the, my device then says, yeah, okay, I'm ready to connect and simply hands over the device's GUID saying, hey, I'm good, please connect me. Then the cloud says, great, let's connect and the tunnel is created. Now, the minute we saw that, we were like, wait, what the fuck? Where the hell are the secrets? I mean, the, all, the, any, all the things that my device sent to the cloud was my device's GUID, which, like I've showcased to you before, is goddamn public knowledge, meaning it is actually exposed on my device's certificate. This meant that by simply knowing a device's GUID, we could try and impersonate it. And that is exactly what we did. Meaning we went to Western Digital proxy servers and simply connected, saying, hey, I'd like to connect. I am this and that GUID. And the minute we did that, the server actually trusted that and said, yeah, I'm ready to uh, initiate the connection and disconnected the real device. Meaning that whenever a user tries to connect to, a, to their, their device now, they would be redirected to us. That is pretty crazy because now we were able to impersonate the device and act as it. However, what was even crazier was what happened next. You see, the minute we authenticated and created a tunnel, this request reached us. As you can see, this is an HTTP request from the client saying, hey, I want to refresh the volumes on my NAS device. However, what's crazy is that it actually contains the user authentication token. We didn't, we were actually pretty stumped at first saying, yeah, we didn't make this request. However, upon further investigation, we realized that in order to make sure everything is up to date and uh, users have bad, good user experience, Western Digital performs background app refresh, meaning constantly in the background, the API, the client connects to the NAS and says, hey, please refresh the files and give me access to my newer files. And because of that, a new request is made every 10 seconds or so. This meant that whenever the minute we stole a device's tunnel, uh, we got a request from the user containing the user token. And this actually meant that the minute we steal device's tunnel, we have authentic, admin, authenticated administrative tokens to that device. 
This meant that once again, by impersonating the device, we could access everyone's file around the world, giving us full administrative access to every NAS device Western Digital implodes. Thank you. Yeah, that, we actually did it. We actually got this access twice in two months, which I think is a personal record for me. <laughs> so, after we gained administrative access, access, the next step was simply finding an RCE, which Sharon will present to you now. Great. Uh, so, just let, let's reiterate real quick. Uh, we were able to leak all the goods, all the device identifications from every Western Digital uh, cloud connected device and we used it uh, because of a flaw in our archi cloud architecture. We, we used it uh, to basically find a bypass to their authentication and reach the devices. So we first impersonated the devices. Once we impersonated the devices we got redirection and uh, we got requests from real users with their tokens and we now were able to impersonate the users. So basically uh, we had admin access in while impersonating users we had admin access to their devices uh, because after we created the tunnel impersonating the real the devices we got the tokens and we disconnected our tunnel and we were able to connect to the, the, the real device tunnel. But sadly we wanted remote code execution and admin access, admin web access does not mean remote code execution. So we had to come up with new ways to leverage our admin access to remote code execution. So we turned out, we turned to the REST SDK uh, binary once again and we had a lot of new surface to research now because we were fully authenticated. Previously when we researched this binary we looked only on pre-authenticated routes and APIs and as Noah mentioned this was a Golang so it was very difficult <laughs> and uh, time consuming to, to go over all the functions. Um, but we now had new, uh, new vector, uh, authenticated vector, so it was very important for us to cover more APIs and more routes. Uh, the first, one of the first routes we looked at uh, was the shares, shares and mounts. So we're talking about a NAS device now. Obviously, a NAS device uh, main goal is to store your your files and make sure you have the ability to read those files and write those files. So basically when you open the, the platform, the web platform or the mobile application, you see uh, directories from your hard drives inside the NAS. And obviously the goal of the NAS again is to let you the ability to read and write files from these directories. What we discovered by reverse engineering these routes is behind the scene the NAS operating system has sim links to directories inside the hard drives. So whenever you see for example pub public directory in the web interface or the mobile application basically it shows you the content of slash hd slash hd whatever and then public. So we thought what happens if we had the capability to switch this sim link to for example slash. This means that we will see on the web interface which we have access to because we are now user authenticated, we will see files from slash. And indeed we find a way, undocumented way to modify, change um, the routes, the mounting points on the device simply by using the, the file system API we could now change directories, change their, their mounting points to different directories. And we actually tried it and it worked. So for example here, we created a new share which is mapped to slash temp and we simply saw files and directories from slash temp on the device. Previously we could not do this because these files and directories uh, were not allowed to be accessed from the mobile application. O o Obviously the mobile application, the web interface only wanted to show you files that you can interact with from your hard drive. So it was pretty crazy because we had write, read and write primitive because we just had access to any directory we wanted on the device. The truth is we did not have unlimited 
read and write access uh, because the file system had some restrictions to where files can be written. Uh, some directories and some mounting points were read only. So, for example, we could not overwrite binaries on the device. Uh, so, we had to be very creative to think how can we leverage this primitive, read and write primitive, into a remote code execution. For example, one of the things we thought of is maybe we could, we could download the device configuration, modify it, for example, to change uh, where the device downloads the firmware from, and then rewrite the configuration. However, we found an easier way. One of the routes we also looked at is the do reboot. So users, Western Digital users, can go to their uh, cloud platform and reboot their devices remotely. So since we had the user token, we could do this on behalf of the user. So we could basically initiate uh, a reboot process on the device. Now, what we found out is the reboot process is not that straightforward on the devices, so it's not just doing reboot, it actually activating a specific binary called the do reboot. And as it turned out, this binary does more things than just rebooting the device. For example, it reads files from the slash temp directory and it parses them and uses the parse data somehow. Western Di Digital did this because there are many ways uh, or many uh, Many times you'll, the device will want to do a reboot based on different states. For example, it wants to initiate auto reboot whenever there is a firmware upgrade. So it needs to read th these uh, states from somewhere. And they decided to use files on slash temp. So what we did is we investigated this uh, code path in the binary and we found that we can write a file to slash temp in a way that will give us some injection point into a system command which will be which will get executed. So now we had the ability to execute code on the device if we are authenticated which we were um, and we had our chain complete. So I would like to go over uh, the, the full chain. Basically it starts with us leaking GUIDs of all the devices in the world uh, and we can even do this real time as now mentioned by getting the CTL feed. And we used it to impersonate real device and get user tokens whenever they auto reconnect to the tunnel. Then we're using the user token to connect to the real tunnel, to the real device, and we're creating new mounting points. And then we're writing file to the slash temp and getting uh, and doing reboot and getting code execution. So let's see it uh, full scale. Now, the user, first of all, the real user is connected to the device and we as attackers want to get their uh, device. So we're impersonating the device by telling the cloud, hey, we're this device identification, the GUID. And at the moment we're doing this, the cloud will disconnect the real tunnel and connect us. Whenever it happens, the user auto reconnects either using their tokens to our device, to the, our impersonated device, and now we can impersonate the user. So we're canceling the tunnel and waiting for the real device to issue new tunnel, and we're using the token to actually connect to the real device. Next, we're uh, creating new mounting point to point at slash temp, and we are writing our file which will be parsed and be used in the reboot process, finally giving us a reverse shell. <laughs> and, and this is exactly what we did in Pong to On, so we got uh, on top of the reverse shell, we got al also 40K, so it was nice. Uh, we, we used it to hack a device in Pong to On, but basically we were not limited to just Pong to On or, or a single device. We could exploit any device that we know the, its device identification, the GUID, and we had thousands of, of them, may, 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 maybe millions. So it was a, a great power and with great power comes great responsibility. So uh, obviously we reported this to Western Digital and we worked with them until everything was resolved. Now, we, uh, we had a concept in our hands. 
So basically, uh, we had the concept of impersonating an IoT device and using and leverage this impersonation to do something on behalf of the device. In this case, in the Western Digital case, it was impersonating a device and waiting to get the user token to use it. But since we competed in Pong on we wanted to leverage this for Synology as well. So let's go over in real quick uh, what we did in Synology. So for Synology, we researched the DS920. Uh, this is a very similar device uh, to the WD. Uh, it's also Linux based with 86 architecture 64 bit. Uh, and it had um, a really fully featured web interface uh, running CGI's written in C. Um, behind the scene, the web server is Nginx, and it has a very rich configuration that we could play with. Uh, but we could not find any straightforward pre authenticated uh, remote code execution uh, chains, so we turned out to the cloud. Now, similarly to previous uh, device, with Synology has uh, a fully featured cloud called Quick Connect. So basically, if anyone wants to reach their device, they'll go to quickconnect.2 and will enter their device alias. How do you get your device alias? You first need to authenticate on the device itself and associate the device with your Synology user. Whenever you do this uh, in the web configuration on the device itself, you uh, basically exchange a couple of uh, tokens and APIs on the device and now the device is capable to connect to the cloud uh, and be associated with the alias you give it. So very simply how it works, whenever a user go, goes to quick connect um, and wants to initiate a uh, connection to their device, they will, they will go to alias.quickconnect.2 and the cloud will relay uh, the request to the device and basically will tell the device to open a VPN tunnel. So whenever the Synology quick connect cloud receives the request, it will initiate a tunnel open VPN tunnel with the device uh, and now the user can reach their device through this uh, relay point inside the VPN tunnel. Now if you noticed uh, we're also using here subdomains so we could also harvest all the aliases of all Synology devices in the world uh, and yeah we did the same so we had a list of uh, thousands of may maybe millions of subdomains basically aliases of devices of Synology devices. But we wanted more, obviously. We wanted to understand how does the device, what type of tokens or secrets does the device use to connect to Quick, quick Connect Cloud Platform and uh, to initiate the VPN tunnel. So we researched this process for a very long time uh, because it, it, it is a long process. Um, and if we summarize all the digital elements or the tokens or the secrets, whatever you want to call it, um, uh, we made a, a quick list for this. So, for example, the device needs to know its MAC address, serial number, device module, some tokens in order to connect to the Quick Connect cloud platform and start and initiate this tunnel. So, if we wanted to impersonate the device, we had to have these identifiers. And if you look at it, some of the identifiers are quite straightforward. For example, the MAC address is very easy to get. But also the serial number and the device module are, are easy to get. Uh, apparently Synology dis has this discovery utility. So whenever you buy a new device, you can activate the discovery utility and search for devices around you on the local network. So we basically implemented this protocol to get the basic identifiers such as a serial number, module, and MAC. So now we had the first uh, elements that we needed uh, for, uh, th the first elements that we needed to impersonate the device. By the way, the DS token uh, is some kind of uh, deterministic um, algorithm that based on the serial number. So Whenever we had the serial number, we could now calculate this uh, DS token. Um, next, we had to get the API key, which is the device quick connect key. This token and also the authentication token are tokens that are being generated whenever the user associates their, their Synology user on the device. So 
we thought it could be impossible to get those because it only happens once on the device and then they are not being exchanged anymore. But after researching a lot of different endpoints and routes on the cloud platform and also researching and reverse engineering different binaries and uh, other endpoints on the device itself, we figured uh, there is a bug, uh, apparently what seems to be a bug, on the cloud platform. So apparently if we try, we ask nicely the cloud to register for us a new API token ju and just giving it a serial number, it will be enough to generate a new valid API token on behalf of the device. So just by knowing the serial number and the MAC address and also the mod model, we could actually generate new API token for the device and use it. That was crazy. <laughs> Next, we needed the authentication key, uh, which was very similar. It it's another token, uh, but also a different a, a token that we needed to get access to. Uh, and we thought we were very lucky in the first time, so there is no way we were able to get this the second time, but we were able to get this uh, due to another bug in another feature uh, of uh, DNS. Uh, the, the dynamic DNS feature of the devices. Uh, so basically, again, they forgot to do some stronger authentication, and again, we were able to get this token that we needed to impersonate the device. Now w that we had both tokens and all the basic identifiers, we basically could receive any information we want on the device, and we had our list completed. So we had all the information we need in order to impersonate any Synology device that we want. That's crazy. <laughs> so what we did with it, we now were in the context of a real uh, device. We impersonated a, a real device and we thought how can we leverage this into a remote, remote code execution. So the first thing that we did was telling the cloud, hey, we're this real device for real, please change the IP address that you think I'm at to a different one. Basically what we were trying to do is to make the cloud platform to relay users instead of the real device to our CNC. And it worked because we fully impersonated the device and the cloud fully trusted us. We had all the secrets. We had the tokens, we had the serial number, we had the MAC address, we had everything that we need. And the server really relayed users to our CNC and again, we got their tokens and we were, we were able to access uh, the real device. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so just to sum up real quick. Users want to connect to their devices. But because of a couple of flaws and vulnerabilities we uncovered in the cloud architecture, we were able to redirect users to our impersonated device. Once we were getting the user tokens, we used these tokens and impersonated the users, so we basically connected on behalf of the users to their real device. Now, to sum up, cloud services focus on strong user authentication. It's very difficult these days to bypass user authentication. But we believe that device authentication is a bit overlooked. So in many cases we've seen IoT architectures using weak or public knowledge identifiers to authenticate devices. So obviously this needs to be changed and we already contacted a couple of big vendors uh, that we found bugs in. So maybe we'll be here next week, next year. Uh, and we really want to change this and emphasize that impersonated devices can be real danger. Thank you. <laughs> so I'm not sure about questions. Should we do questions here? Okay, you're invited to follow us wherever you go. Thank you.